So you should see the PowerPoint that says mentor training on it. Yes. Perfect. Whew. That's a lot. Okay. So this is just the beginning. Oh, I haven't updated everything. I see on the front slide down at the bottom, it says Youth Chaplaincy Coalition Circle Faith Future. Uh, Circle Faith Future is my overarching organization, but we've recently changed our name from Youth Chaplaincy Coalition to Youth Rise, partly because nobody really understands chaplains in the juvenile detention system. And we do more than just chaplaincy in religious um, services. So. Right. We are going to be going over these topics today. We'll do some introductions, <laughs> policy, general engagement strategies, our accompaniment model, notes on developing a listening relationship, notes on structuring your time, and then we will wrap up. Um, so Alyssa, you won't need to be here for the notes on structuring your time or the, the wrapping up part. That's really specific to ECHO, okay? So since we're a small group, I thought we could actually take time and do a nice introduction and share our name, where we're residing and what your interest in mentoring is and where you're gonna mentor at. And then just random question, what is your favorite time of day? So. Mm. I'll go first and then I will invite someone to go and then that person goes and they invite the next person to go. Got it? Yep. Perry Stewart, I live in Woodinville. Um, my interest in mentoring is, uh, I've been doing it a while uh, and want everybody to have good mentors. And my favorite time of day, I actually had two favorite times is like right when I wake up, I, it's my um, kind of get myself together time, meditate, pray, and do all the things. And then in the evening, I have a lot of energy and get a lot of things done. So they kind of balance each other out at the beginning and end of the day. And I'm at Echo and I'm at King County. So I would like to invite Kango. Yeah, my name is Kang Ho Lee and I live in Sammamish. And uh, currently I'm volunteering at the Echo Glen and doing math tutoring and uh, participating in the Bible studies. And uh, yeah, while I'm doing the, uh, the, what's that, the tutoring, I really enjoy talking to the kids because they only can focus on studying 10 minutes. So I usually spend like 15 minutes just talking whatever the topic they want to talk to. And I really enjoyed it and uh, I, their background is totally different than my children. I never had that. And I have some, I shouldn't say sympathy, but I want to help them out uh, with, I mean, that there is a different role models out there and uh, whatever they went through is not the reality. That's the uh, only hope they have. So yeah, I just want to do a little bit of mentoring. This will be my first time doing it. I don't know, I'll be good at it or not, but. Yeah, I'll try. And my favorite time of the day is, uh, yeah, after lunch. Right. I slowly waking up and get charged. And yeah, today, especially days, really good weather. So I'm excited. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. And Congo, you get to invite the next person. The only person I know is Glenn. Okay. <laughs> hey, Glenn. Good to see you. Hey, great to see you, man. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I'm Glenn. I live in Sammamish as well. Um, I plan to work at Echo. I, uh, uh, my interest in mentoring, I think, I, I have been doing mentoring. Uh, I have a couple of mentees, formal and informal. Um, I'll coach a team. I'm a manager in a cybersecurity role with the third largest software company in the world. And, uh, you know, I've reached a point in my career where I've come to realize what truly has value for me. And this is how I define it is honestly what you can do to give back to someone else. And so my priorities are shifting and, um, this, this, this is in that sweet spot um, of, of being able to give back in some way. And, and 
you know, if if you know my own failings aside, if by God's grace I could help make a difference in someone's life in some way, you know, that would be reward enough, quite frankly. Favorite time of day is in the evening, just uh, on the water, we, we're into boating and on the water in the evening when the sun goes down in one of these calm bays around this part of the world, it, uh, something very special happens and it's hard to put into words. And uh, yeah, just uh, become very aware of God's presence and uh, you know, the sufficiency of that is, is, is astonishing and it's very beautiful. So yeah, that's my favorite time of day. All right, thanks. And you get to invite someone. I'll invite Alyssa. Hello, uh, my name is Alyssa. I'm currently residing in Seattle. Um, so I'll be working at the King County or volunteering at the King County um, facility. Um, I'm interested in mentoring. Um, I think it's a great opportunity to like not only try to make a change or difference um, in their lives and like let them know someone's there to care for them. Um, but I also actually want to work as like a rehabilitation therapist um, eventually like later in life. So I think it's just, it gives me some experience too. Um, and like, I guess a reality check on what they might actually go through. Um, so I think just like mentoring is a great way to you know be there for them as well um and my favorite time of day I like the morning um I really like I wake up super early so I love seeing the sunrise um and it I think it's just very peaceful and I get to like it's quiet so I could just get to be in all of my surroundings and I think it's really beautiful nice. and then I guess uh do I call on Jojo yep Great, thank you. Hi, yes, I'm Jojo. Um, I live in Bellevue and um, I have been mentoring, involved with mentoring since um, about 2010 at both Echo Glen and King County um, with a couple of years off in between, um, but did that as a student at Seattle U. Um, and uh, now I'm working with Terry um, to work on the ministry side, chaplaincy side of things um, and help with managing volunteers at both King County and Echo. Um, and my favorite time of the day would be evening, not day or morning. I wish I could, but it, I can't. So <laughs> I won't. <laughs> That's fair. Totally fair. All right. So thank you. Um, I also, so while I go through the presentation, I encourage everyone to do their own adulting. Like if you need to go to the bathroom, just get up and go to the bathroom. Or if you have questions, speak up or type them. I won't necessarily notice if you type it into the chat. So if you do type it in the chat, somebody should wave their arms about wildly. Um, and that way we'll all uh, get this, get through this, okay? All right. So the first thing on the docket is policy. So the volunteers until informed should wear an N95 mask at Echo Glen and a generic kind of hospital mask at King County. Uh, the idea at King County is people were starting to wear masks that were had messages on them and it was starting to get a little bit cranky. And so they just said, fine, everybody's wearing the same thing. So just the regular hospital mask, and you can get them when you check in at King County. Um, just a note about our policy on faith sharing in both buildings is a positive consent model, which as you see in other parts of life, a positive consent model means that the youth need to be invitational to have that uh, conversation. And it's not that um, you can't talk about your faith in terms of your very own life, like this is what it means to me and using I pronouns and that kind of thing. But uh, the we don't want to put the youth into situations where they're having to, where they feel like they're forced to listen to that. And that doesn't actually do a great service to our faiths anyway. So those are the two things to keep in mind. And uh, 
there's more about the faith sharing model if you want to get into it. Um, but I just generally say follow the lead of the youth. And if they're interested in it, just be discerning and then go where they go. All right. So our general engagement strategies, our motto of our organization is listen, listen, love, love. And so uh, we're going to talk about in, underneath of general engagement, the spirit of listening, a thing called the upward spiral of autonomy, and then uh, creativity and different learning modalities and trauma and how that affects mentoring. So the spirit of listening is more like the two little kids dancing together than the wrestler splatting the other wrestler. Don't <laughs> do that. <laughs> so trying to be open, cooperative. Uh, I, I like using dance as a metaphor because they're dancing together, but their eyes are looking forward at different things. Like even though they're looking the same direction, they see things slightly differently. So they're able to create something together that they wouldn't have been able to create apart. So uh, also when we're mentoring, you keep in mind different learning modalities for people. Um, some people are art people, some people are music people, like they just learn differently. Kinesthetics, like we all have our own way of learning. Um, I use art sometimes, even with kids that are not so artistic. As you can see, this is like not a very artistic collage that one of the kids made, but even in his non-artisticness, uh, he communicated something that uh, was surprising to me. And that was this whole thing about the Listerine toothpaste, right? So uh, we made a collage together and this is what he did is like fast cars, watch the little tiny words. He is Muslim. So that says Quran is really small over there. And then the toothpaste, and I was like, why toothpaste? What did that say for you, right? And he gave me an entire lecture on dental hygiene. So, uh, which was totally unexpected for, yeah, never have had that happen before and haven't had it happen since. So, uh, but it gave me an end to a different conversation with him because he was not able to imagine things that he could do for his future. But then to be able to talk about like dental hygienist or these kinds of careers that he has a passion for clearly that he might be able to kind of dip into rather than um, not having an imagination for his future. And then sometimes you have kids that are very artistic because this is a collage, but you couldn't tell that it's a collage. It's like different things put together. And when I asked the youth uh, about this collage, as we were doing it together, I asked him who he was in terms of what he was seeing. And so the, the little pinprick of light um, that's in the hillside, that was who he was. He was the light hmm. shining in the distance. So hmm. that also gives us a different way of opening up different conversations. So these are just ideas um, that you can do, but just a reminder to hold the idea of not everybody's word people, not everybody learns by greeting and not everybody shares their best in that way. Sometimes we just need to upend our own way of thinking and get to it in a different way. I also want to talk about the upward spiral of autonomy. It's so fun. Um, so it's funny because uh, the words, the bullet points are listed in order from top down, but the upward spiral is actually from the bottom up. So it, yeah, I get confused every time I look at it. But um, it's just starting how you establish your relationship, starting with understanding and respecting youth values help uh, modeling healthy decision making related to values um, connecting to the mentees to experience to experiences and opportunities that help them make healthy decision making and then helping youth understand how to align their values and behavior and then after that you can have really good conversations about behavioral change there is some research about listening relationships and how they develop. And uh, if you had like four months of a listening relationship commitment, like if you were mentoring a particular youth or hanging out with them, you would probably spend half of your time just developing enough trust to be able to get to the really hard 
topics. It's a little different at King County. Jojo, do you mind um, sharing a little bit of your experiences about sharing with kids at King County? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, yeah, I think that it it does differ um, because of the circumstances. A lot of times kids are at King County um, are there for a shorter time period. Um, and so there isn't as much time to build that kind of foundation. And um, sorry, I have a friend here. Um, and uh, so that is one thing that at King County, um, sometimes people are able to just kind of dive in with you and get really deep really quick. And there are other times um, where it's kind of just more of accompanying that person, um, community, um, playing game card games. A lot of times you're not getting into um, potentially like deeper conversations that you might after knowing someone for a little bit longer, a kid for a little bit longer. You also have a little less privacy, I think, at King County than yeah. you do at Echo Glen. So that impacts yes. your yeah. ability to have those deeper um, connections. So we have an accompaniment model, uh, which is like working with, not for, or walking with, not pushing from behind or pulling from the front, just walking side by side. It's relationship building first and then resource compiling second. Trying to dip into our empathetic selves, not making snap judgments. And uh, it's hard. Like, I think we, it's like we encounter behaviors and things that are outside of our experiences. Sometimes it's hard to not make snap judgments. And then, but we're all guilty of it. And we do it, even I've been doing this for uh, since I've been working with incarcerated people since 2003. So I've been doing this a long time and still I find myself hung up every now and then on something and I'm like, oh, well, that was a good lesson to remind me not to do that, <laughs> right? Um, there's that walking with, um, empowering, not chastising and planning and not promising. So uh, some people over promise their commitments and so that is not cool, but planning is different than promising, right? So I plan to be here next week. I will let you know if I'm not going to be. All right. So developing a listening relationship. I want to talk a little bit about listening through a trauma lens. So most of the youth that we encounter, I feel like, are uh, have experienced a large amount of trauma in their life by the time they have arrived at a place that we are with them. Um, the research with just all children is that 10% of children experience physical abuse at home. 20, oh, that is supposed to be sexual abuse. I made it a typo, sorry. 25% experience physical abuse, 28%, oh, wait. You know what? I'm gonna rewind myself. 10% experience physical abuse at home. 25% experience uh, emotional neglect at home, so emotional abuse. 28% of women and 16% of men experience sexual abuse as children, and that is generalized outside of the home, not just within the home. And then it just gets worse for incarcerated youth. And the way that it affects us, um, if we think of the survival mode of flight, fight, or freeze, the rush of adrenaline and all the chemicals that go through their bodies when they are triggered into remembering any of this trauma that they have uh, experienced just stops them from thinking. Because if you can see where the little blue dot is, right, that's kind of your feeling center. That's the limbic system. The yellow dot, that's your uh, ability to think things through and have higher order thinking. And then the amygdala is down there at the bottom. So when a person has experienced trauma, they have a hard time getting to that thinking part of their brain when they're in a crisis situation. And a lot of times in uh, incarceration settings, a crisis situation is very broad. Uh, the slamming of a door could be very triggering because those doors slam really, really loud, right? So they are always, always 
heightened in their awareness of what is going on. So bringing in a calm presence to help bring that down is the one of the things that we can do and even helping them just breathe through some of their things. I was um, working with a, a group at Echo Glen. We had a group, it was a pretty large group on the day we were there and we decided to have a game day. So we went outside and we were playing um, red light, green light, right? And one of the kids just started having a meltdown. So overall, the game was going fine. The kids were cheating, but they were cheat on the outside, like trying to cheat the red light and the green light, you know? Uh, like that was normal cheating behavior. But this one young man was just had a total meltdown and it was all about the cheating. Um, and it was he was going to be sent back to the cottage because the staff did not uh, approve of this meltdown at all, right? He didn't hurt anybody else, but it was just getting loud and he was um, really emotional. And I just asked if I could ask a few questions, right? And so I just asked him, I just no did a noticing to him. Your reaction seems not in proportion to the game that's happening, right? And why can you tell me why that is that was all i did it was nothing special and then it the story of learning when he learned the game he was in first grade and his teacher that taught him that game who he loved had been murdered right so this game tapped into this entire uh, trauma reaction that he had but at that point, since we could interrupt it and he could notice why he's having the reaction, I could ask him if he could set aside his reaction to it right now so that he could stay and play the game. And then he said yes. And then he asked staff if he could stay. And it was fine from that point on. So it, does, it doesn't take rocket science to make actually a really big interruption of bad behavior. So ACEs are uh, adverse childhood experiences. And then that's plural. That's the S is just the plural. There's more than one. <laughs> so the adverse childhood experiences are these categories of abuse and neglect and household dysfunction. The original study was done with over 17,000 people by Kaiser Permanente. And it was done in Florida with an average age of 57 and a majority of women. And of that population, which is a middle-aged, fairly secure, financially female, predominantly female, but not too much, like 55% female um, uh, population, they found that 64% of that population had at least one experience of these uh, types of um, abuse or childhood experiences. So 64%, that's like two thirds of all the people in the world, right? <laughs> have at least one. 12.5% have a score of four or more. And 25% of all households have substance abuse happening and 25% also have physical abuse happening. So uh, there is a one-to-one -one correlation, which they call a dosage correlation one-to-one -one correlation between the number of ACEs and with suicide attempts, alcoholism, and depression. So the experience of ACEs has a direct effect on whether a person will have these uh, traumatic responses in their uh, lives. For us, for youth in the justice system, Florida does some really good studies, even though they have really weird things happening all the time, it seems like. But they did a study with girls in the juvenile justice system. And you can see the dark blue is the original sample. So the uh, they were comparing it to the women. So the percentage of zero mm -hmm is like 35%, right? Because we were saying about 66%, 65% were at zero. Um, so 35% at zero and only, let's say, less than 5% of girls in the juvenile justice system have just zero ACEs. And then it starts creeping up 
with the vast majority <laughs> having four or more adverse childhood experiences, right? Over 62% or so have had four or more adverse experiences, which is like the flip experience of the general population. So we know that we are dealing with youth who have had traumatic experiences through their lifetime. And that is likely um, why they are where they are. Um, in trauma studies, they uh, describe behavioral traumatic responses as adaptive responses. If we think of all behavior as an adaptive response to whatever's happening in our life, then we can say like, it can be an adaptive response that helps them or it can be an adaptive response that hurts them. But it is really just about how they are adapting to the trauma in their life and where it has led them to at this point in time. The newest thinking on ACEs is called the Philadelphia ACEs and it's added these five more categories, which is witnessing violence, feeling discriminated against, adverse neighborhood experiences, being bullied or living in foster care. They also add to that um, kind of uh, feeling and traumatic responses that uh, the youth that we encounter will have, especially I think the youth, a lot of the youth that we encounter have had experiences in foster care and witnessed violence and had adverse experiences in their neighborhood, especially those three. So let me throw the question out there so I can drink some water. You all can talk. Why is ACEs important to mentors? Why do you think? Okay. Well, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll throw an idea out right. here, Jerry. Um, well, I mean, I think for a start, you know, to just to build the beginnings of that empathy and to be sensitive around, um, you know, our approach that, that would make us a little bit more, um, like you say, walking with someone and, you know, allowing them to set the pace and, um, you know, and us being careful about you know dealing with these topics knowing it's highly likely that it's you know it's it's real visceral raw and and going to be hard to talk about and, and you know might not be something you're gonna you know even go there for quite a while like you say until that trust is established yeah yeah it is important yes for all those reasons and um i always think of the this one youth that i um, was mentoring for a while and he uh, suffered from depression. I'm sure the depression was a reaction to a lot of things in his environment, but I never realized how um, trauma, traumatic just being in the environment of incarceration was mm -hmm. um, until we had been sitting together. He was in a real low place. So literally we were I made a space for us to sit together in quiet and that was it. We didn't talk at all. We just stayed quiet in the room together. And he, but even in the quietness, he's listening to everything that's happening in the space that he's in. And a code was called, like, I didn't hear anything, but he heard it. So he is on hyper alert state all the time. So a lot of the youth that we encounter are going to be that way. So it's, uh, the more we can understand that, the more we can show up in a good way in response to that, I think. Jerry, what does that look like? I mean, in practical terms, and then sorry to ask a, a dumb question here. No, it's perfect. Psychological interruption. Here you are. <laughs> Here's parts of your answers. I'm leading the witness here. Okay. You are very good. Leading the witness. <clears throat> um, actually, there's really good science about just being reliable. Right. Um, uh, there's studies that are show uh, kind of relate that youth who have had traumatic experiences, especially in their homes, start doing that negative association. And it's not a conscious association, but they start negatively associating adults with pain. 
right? Mm -hmm. So if you show up and you're kind and you're reliable, you start undoing that association. That And that's not even having to do any work. Like just doing that part is uh, the first step in the door. Modeling good decision-making yourself, um, working on developing a good relationship, collaborating. There's great research around co-creating goal uh, plans with youth instead of just coming in and say, we're going to do this or letting the youth say, we're going to do this. But the science around co-creating activities together um, is uh, it, it can't be touched, right? So for a mentor, your outcomes will be greater and have a greater effect if you co-create your activities together. So, and then um, being a co-teacher in the space, uh, I think of, I don't know if you all, if anybody's read uh, Paolo Ferrari. So he uh, was an educator from Brazil and he talked about uh, teaching in such a way that he's like, he's the subject matter expert, but the people that he's with are the experts of their lives. So they're co-teaching together because he is learning from them and they are learning from him. Um, and then listening and loving. I don't think, um, there's actually some really interesting stuff coming up in research around leadership and love. Uh, and we don't talk about it in our business sense very much, but uh, it's coming. Just wait, somebody's gonna write a, a book on it. <laughs> It'll be the next great seller. But the good news is that helping youth develop res resiliency and building relationships defeats ACEs or the traumatic responses. Like those are the things that can undo it. So we, yay. One of the skills we borrow to help us develop all of this is comes from motivational interviewing. So we're gonna like dip our toe into borrowing some therapeutic tools, but we're not gonna be therapists. So uh, motivational air interviewing is a tool that we can kind of use. And this is one of their kind of uh, acronyms that they use a lot. And they talk about listening and using ORs, which is just using open-ended questions, affirmations, reflections, and summaries. So yeah, you get in trouble if you start asking yes, no questions because it'll just, be yes or no, right? You don't actually get any information, but if you like tell me about or how did or what is or describe those kind of open-ended questions and then affirmations start with you like a sentence that would be about you, like you are instead of being like I am, right? So you are stronger than you know. I have seen you be more resilient than I could ever imagine being. I had a young woman who was like, she's like, I could never give a, a speech in front of people or be a leader. And I'm like, I see you every day leading all these girls in detention. I know you can be a good leader, right? She was not shy when she's with the other girls, but she didn't have that image of herself as being a leader, but she definitely was a leader, right? But being genuine and meaningful and specific, like stating specific behaviors that you see, not just being like, you're awesome, right? But you're awesome because I see you do this, right? Um, so a, in a study that was looking at change talk, affirmations were found to be the only core skill that increased change talk and decreased uh, the, the anti-change talk, right? So affirmations was the only core skill to increase change talk and decrease, they call it sustaining talk. So sustaining their negative talk, right? Reflections is just reflecting back uh, what they have said to you. Um, I usually try to remember to be humble when you do reflective statements. Um, so it's like, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think I hear you saying, or I understand, I think, do you mean that? Like, so just reflecting back so that you are checking for understanding and uh, yeah. Yes, just checking for understanding. You can get more complex. You can check for understanding and then uh, do something more complex. Like if they're telling some a tale and then 
a simple reflection might be the justice system is complicated. I hear you. But a complex reflection would be the justice system is complicated and everyone should be treated the same, right? So it expands the meaning just a little bit, right? So complex reflection it takes the reflection and then expands the meaning a little bit. And then summaries are, it, it's really good at the end of a session um, to just kind of look back at what you have done and uh, yeah, just check in with a question. So summarizing your overall time together and restating any affirmations you might want. And then uh, just maybe say, where does this leave you for next time? Or uh, what are you gonna think about over the week what, until I'm back? Those kind of things. Any questions? All right, this picture is because there's only one in 20 people that find it helpful being told what to do and how they should change, right? So we're not gonna be the one in 20 people. <laughs> They're not gonna be the kid we get. Like no kids really like being told what to do. Just a cool picture that shows just one thing. So there you go. Um, there is an art to powerful questions uh, and they are uh, trying to, the most powerful questions try to get to the why of the situation. So if you're talking with a youth about their relationship with their parents or whatever, um, like here's the same kind of question in four different ways, right? Are you satisfied with your relationship with your parents? That's a yes, no question. So you're not gonna get a lot of meaning, right? It's not a very powerful question. Or whereas if you say, when have you been most satisfied with your relationship with the parents? You're gonna get something more descriptive. And then what are things in your relationship with your parents that you find satisfying? And then why do you think your relationship with your parents has ups and downs? So it's like progressing in how much meaning you're going to get. It's really how you construct a question. Sometimes it's really hard to think on the fly about constructing a question, but luckily we don't have to be perfect. We just keep on trying and getting better all the time. Um, it is really important to examine your own assumptions uh, that are built into questions because there's a, like a huge assumption that is built into all of these questions. Jojo, you're nodding your head. What is it? Do you know? What's my assumption? <clears throat> the assumption would first off is that they have parents. Yeah. Um, they might have guardians in their life, but maybe not a traditional parent role or mother, father. Um, mm -hmm. And so that's kind of the first one is yeah. kind of assuming that, I guess. <laughs> yep. Nope. That's it. Exactly. Yep. So being aware of our own biases, um, it's really hard to frame out language around families and parents and guardians and the really complicated relationships that they uh, can tend to have. But just being curious and being honest with youth uh, goes a long ways to creating a shared understanding. Yes. And sorry, I want to add on to what I said too. I think it's also good to not um, have the assumption that they don't have parents either. You know, there are a lot of kids that, that are in detention that have great support systems, have supportive parents and all of that as well. So just not assuming either way, right. That someone either has a support system or doesn't um, because of the situation that they're in. Yes, exactly. And I think, um, one of the first activities that you can do if, to get towards uh, answering kind of this is if you do a like a collaborative um, project that might be creating their uh, social safety net, right? So that you're working on that and you're learning about who's around them that they can rely on. And so you're able to start understanding, like, do they have parents in their life that they can rely on and that kind of thing. Although I would not use those words that I just use social safety net with the kids. Um, it, bring that language down to like normal language. <laughs> normal language. There we go. So framing better questions. If we always think about, is the question actually relevant? Is, do you actually want to know the answer? 
I mean, it really depends on what you want to talk about, where you want to go on that day. If it's just at the beginning of your relationship, maybe not getting to the why always is the most important thing, but just getting into the who, the what, those kind of things. And just creating a space where more questions can come up. This is another dip into therapy land. Um, this is CBT, which is cognitive behavioral therapy. Sounds really fancy, but it's not. So they call it the ABCs of CBT. Um, the A is there is an activating event, like some traumatic thing triggers them, like the, the game of red light, green light. That's the activating event. B, the beliefs and thoughts. So his beliefs and thoughts were these kids are cheating. They are dishonoring my teacher. C, his consequences is the behavior, right? So his behavior is he had an eruption, right? So what, our, what we can try to do is to interrupt between the B and the C to help create an imagination where they can see a different consequence to their beliefs and thoughts. So you're working backwards. You make that interruption. You start changing their beliefs and thoughts that that is not the way that it has to be, right? It, it's uh, uh, A lot of it is um, mindfulness, it really comes down to being mindful and present for uh, people that are going through this process because they can feel it in their body. If you, if you have a youth that went through something, like oftentimes they have arguments with other kids in their cottage. Like this is like ongoing cottage drama, just like high school. So um, they could have had a, an event there, right? And Possibly you might have a chance to interrupt something there or to talk to them about it in a healthier, more holistic way. Um, using the active listening skills. So that we talked about in the ORs, which is those open-ended questions, affirmations, reflections, and summaries. So we're gonna go on to a short video about active listening. So my warning is that this is a really kind of sarcastic version of active listening, but the skills that they practice are what you would want, but you would wanna do it in a genuine and open way, but it's, it's a fun way to learn sometimes. <laughs> First, there was PlayStation, a.k.a. PS1. Then there's PS2, PS3, and now PS4. And that makes sense. You'd think after Xbox, there'd be Xbox 2. But no. Next came Xbox 360. Hmm? And now, after 360, comes Xbox One. Why one? Maybe that's how many seconds of thought they put into naming it. Can you get the butter, please? Yeah. You know, however, with the Xbox One, I can control my entire entertainment system using voice commands. Up until now, I've had to use Leonard. <laughs> then get the other one. Pass the butter. Get, hang on. I don't feel like you're taking this dilemma seriously. Fine, Sheldon. You have my undivided attention. Okay, now, the PS4 is more angular and sleek looking. No way! It's true, but the larger size of the Xbox One may keep it from overheating. Well, you wouldn't want your gaming system to overheat. No, see, well, you absolutely would not. And furthermore, the Xbox One now comes with a Kinect included. Included? Yes. Not sold separately. You, although the PS4 uses cool new GDDR5 RAM, while the Xbox One is still using the conventional DDR3 memory. Why would they still be using DDR3? Are they nuts? You, <laughs> see, that's what I thought. But then they go and throw in an ES RAM buffer. Oh, wait, wait, wait a second. Who's they? The Xbox. You're kidding! No, I am not. And this ES RAM buffer should totally bridge the 100 gigabit per second bandwidth gap between the two RAM types. This is a nightmare. How will you ever make a decision? See, I don't know. What should I do? Please pass the butter! So, in that video, once they get into it, I mean, it's playful, it's sarcastic, it's funny, um, but Amy is like using those reflective and just getting into it and doing what you would want to do in, in an authentic, really nice way with you. So that's kind of do what they do, but not like that. 
It was fun to watch. Yes, it is fun. <laughs> there we go. I want to take a moment just and talk about cultural humility, which is just a little bit about how we show up in other people's spaces. Um, Cause we move in and out of different cultures all the time and we don't really think about it as much, um, maybe as much as we should. Um, I would like using the term cultural humility rather than cultural competency because I, I think that I am competent at my own culture, but I'm not competent at someone else's culture, right? Um, it requires like all these things, historical awareness, but humility is what allows you to build bridges between your world and somebody else's world. It is, um, let's see. Yeah, it, 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 humility is just that, that gift that will help you throughout the entire experience going in. Um, there was, there's a medieval uh, um, abbess uh, who wrote a little tiny pamphlet that has survived that is called The Cloud of Unknowing. And she talks about like this unknowing space Right. So that's where you are not building out your assumptions. You're going in humbly and unknowing. And if you if it's not important for you to know about it when you're in the conversation at that time, you just put it onto the cloud and whoosh it away until such a time as you might want to draw it back in. But it's just really uh, assuming that you don't know more than you do know. <laughs> probably true right <laughs> yes well yes and I, I mean I, I Terry I do think about this piece a lot because you know the their experience and my life experience are just so vastly different and it it, it I, there's a genuine risk that I I just bring assumptions uh, you know conscious and unconscious bias um, and micro inequities uh, just just concern me and um, you know, I, I, it behooves us to do as much as we can to understand, um, you know, just some of their realities, just like we're doing here and, and how you're sharing. Um, but material to read and, and, and better research uh, would, be, would be super helpful, I think, certainly for myself. Yeah. Um, so intercultural development is a... Um, so the intercultural development inventory is a uh, measurement tool to kind of see how, where you are on, on the <clears throat> kind of scale of intercultural development. And it's a developmental phase at stage. It is a developmental process like any other thing in our life. We learn as we go, right? And we get better. So it, it ranges from denial is like denial of difference. Like I think... When I think of somebody who's in denial, I think of somebody who lived in a farm in Iowa and has never met anybody that is different than them, right? So they don't understand about difference and what that is. And then it just goes all the way over to integration where you can freely flow in and out of different cultures, um, not adopting or um, appropriating cultures, but being able to go in and out. Uh, nobody ever really makes it to integration. It's like that goal, the pie in the sky that nobody ever quite gets to, but it is a developmental uh, phase. And if you are, we can do another class about that or another training about <laughs> intercultural <laughs> development. Um, yeah, because I, I am a certified facilitator for the intercultural development inventory. So I can do all of that stuff too. Um, I think it's super important. The vast majority of people, 68% of the people are in the middle stage, which is called is minimization, right? In the uh, minimization, you can be even kind of like micro stages within that, where you tend to uh, treat everybody, you understand there's differences, but you people just tend in that phase tend to treat everybody the same. They would be people that are like, uh, but uh, like in church language would be um, people that are like 
God loves everyone, but then they expect love to show up in a very specific way, <laughs> right? Instead of realizing that love is different across cultures and for different people and that there's different ways of expressing it. So um, that kind of thing, or like all people are equally matter, right? So that would definitely be a phrase straight out of minimization, those kind of things. And it's it comes from each stage. We tend to think of these stages of uh, cultural development as either positive or negative, right? We don't want to be in denial. Like nobody wants that, right? But it, that's not uh, what I would try to suggest reframing that a little bit to be um, that each stage has a gift that it brings. And recognizing the gift of minimization is they honestly believe that all people should be loved, right? And that's a gift. Now, then expanding that gift to see that love isn't the same for everyone. Even the, the gift of denial is like just the, the uh, belief that everybody has the same access. I mean, we know that they don't, but it is a, once they realize that people don't have the same access, they jump up to become really great allies because they then want people to have access. Like they can move from there to there really fast, those kind of folks. Anyway, so there is uh, definitely concrete things that you can do to uh, develop your own um, uh, intercultural development. So a whole nother, whole nother training. Um, and this is where I'm going to tell Alyssa that she can sign off because King County um, is going to have a lot more about showing up and being in the moment and present uh, and not developing as much of a long-term relationship, but just really being present at a particular moment, point in time. And it can be wild, wildly changing from one week to the next, I think. Jojo, would you have anything to add to that? Um, no, I I would just agree. Yeah, that it's yeah always changing, and people aren't in the same halls from week to week, and um, yeah. So you just gotta you can't um, expect to to kind of understand the lay of the land each time you go in. It's kind of every day is a little different. Yeah. The one commonality I think that runs between both institutions is that they both have a lot of staff turnover and um, the upper staff, like the management people, they don't turn over as much, but the staff on the floor turn over a lot. And so the volunteers that commit and go in week after week after week have a, are a more long-term presence for the youth than any, than the staff themselves. So, uh, that and as we said, it it doesn't take a lot to start establishing um, a good relationship sometimes, and then starting to undo that idea of oh, adults are horrible people, right? That kind of thing. So, and the the research when they talk about um, how many encounters does it take for a youth to actually be transformed, the research is really ambivalent. It could be one awesome visit. And it could be six months of visits. So it's, it's up in the air. So it's really just show up in the best way you can and be present. Okay. And Thank you so much. you're welcome. And you'll be working with Jojo to do your shadowing and uh, learn about the resources you have specifically at King County. Okay. Thank you, Alyssa. Yes. Thank Thanks, you guys. Alyssa. I'll send you an email. Sounds good. Uh, have a okay. great rest of your day, you guys. All right. Thanks. Thank Bye. you. Bye. All right. We're getting towards the end. Um, we're going to talk about structuring your time. So uh, there's a few notes under there. So structuring a session specifically. Um, let me see. Yeah. No, sorry. I didn't put any notes on here. I was going to put notes on here. But what I was going to say that I didn't type down in structuring a <laughs> session is that uh, the research, the latest research that comes out that has just been published like this summer, because I go to the National Mentoring Summit, um, 
not this summer, but this February just came out, is that that co-creation process of creating plans together about what you want to do together um, is more effective uh, for outcomes than either being driven by the mentor or being driven by the youth. It's that co-creation kind of sweet spot where you both agree on something to do. So for a mentor, what that might look like is bringing in a few different resources and at saying, I want to make sure my time serves you best. It, do you have an idea about what you want to work on? And if not, uh, then here's some ideas I have. Let's decide together what to do, right? So the study that that was done in was a big study too. So it's pretty sound and it was done with incarcerated youth. And so they found that people that put, that uh, did, structured their time in that way by creating um, goals together had a much better outcome especially when coupled by the very next piece, which is play. So adding in an element of fun or play. So the, the structuring of your time should be more like, like working on your task together of what you wanna do and ensuring that you have time for something fun at the end. And it's very um, necessary to do the work before the play, not the play before the work. The other thing that also seems to be very important in the studies is that uh, you should smile throughout the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> be encouraging, smile. But um, there's something about the mirror neurons, right? In the way that the mirror neuron system is that, that kind of mirroring that humans do when they're together and one person starts smiling or laughing and it just cascades and everybody's doing that. There's something about being a positive person there who's reliable and showing up and is smiling and entering into a genuine relationship that just triggers the mirror neuron system. So you don't even have to do anything. Again, you just show up and smile and be a good person, right? I think we can all do that, right? So those, that's kind of the, the study. So it's work, play, smile. I think that's our new motto. There we go. <laughs> all right. Um, I, yes, I would encourage you to build a mentoring toolkit if you uh, want to. Um, it could be a backpack. I have a container that's exactly like this that I just shove stuff into that I want. I print some stuff out at home or whatever contains the stuff I need. So I can have the stuff we're going to work on. I put the um, cards in there or dominoes or other games. Um, and they also have games in the units at Echo, so you can just rely on the games that they have there. And I've bought a couple games for a couple of the units, so uh, there are some fun ones there. So just build build something that is that. And when you start mentoring, um, we need to know what you have in your mentoring toolkit because Echo Glen requires that you make a list of everything that you're going to take in. Um, you don't have to write down what each piece of paper is, but you could just write paper, pens, markers, whatever it is. And little kid scissors, if you're going to do scissors, like if you're going to do a collage project, then you need to have the things to do it with. Um, I will give you access to my Google Drive and Jojo is so kindly reorganizing it for me because it's a mess. Um, it has, this is just some of the stuff that's in there. Uh, there's lots of activities that you could do that you could pull from there um, along with just, you know, general, that's what the internet is for, to look things up, right? So uh, I have a lot of resources stored and I will uh, give you access to it when you have a youth. And then we also at Echo Glen, we have this book called Ink About It, which was created in collaboration with Child Haven and Art with Heart. It was created by counselors in collaboration with the artists. And we had one of the youth at Echo Glen edit it. So it is a specially edited version of Ink About It. And it is bound in uh, with a glue binding instead of a, a staple binding, like most of their work is done or 
no, they usually have a heart. I don't know. It had to be bound differently. So we have a special binding that will pass all the security things. So any kid can have it, no matter what level their um, behavior has had consequences for. In this book, it's like tattoo type art in it. It has a lot of the same activities that are in the Google Drive. There's a few that overlap. Um, but it is, it does give you something to work with week by week if you want to, and you don't have to use all the things in it. The idea, again, is that co-creative process, right? So if there's things in there that work, then use them. If there's things in there that don't work, then don't use them. Um, I think being discerning and um, open is, yeah, more, more key words for us. When I was, I did a, I led a mission trip a long time ago. And when I went to the training, the trainer said, your most important job is to be a flex expert. And I was like, okay, <laughs> I will be a flex expert for the rest of my life. That's what I am. <laughs> and there's the Ink About It books are at Echo Glen, ready for you to use. And yeah, you can use them. All right. So wrapping up, there is the last few things. Once you are assigned a youth, I have a monthly mentoring report. It's just a Google form. Uh, I plan on my next budgeting cycle to um, get a, a product called Mentor Hub, which will give you an app on your phone where you just be able to plug in all the information after you meet. And also it has connections to training and other materials in it. And it is developed by the top um, the top academic um, researchers in the field. So they're doing a really good job. What's next? So you would work with me to get a youth assigned to you and then negotiate a schedule. Let me know any preferences you might have. Send an email to me. You can send it to terry.steward at dcyf.wa.gov or terry at circlefaithfuture.org. It doesn't really matter. I check them both every day. Um, the Circle of Faith Future comes to my phone, so if I'm out of pocket, that's probably the best one to go to. Uh, JoJo's their backup. Um, if you're on campus <coughs> at Echo Glen, then uh, Nick Kushner's your backup. He's the employee there that you would touch base with and security. So those are the things if you decide to go forward into mentoring. All right. And so this is the end of the slideshow. We have gotten to the end. Do you all have any questions or anything you want to talk about or things you want to explore at this time? I just want to say thank you for the class. I have to run right now. So, okay. yeah. Hey, thank you and have a great day, rest of you guys. Yeah. All right. Bye, Congo. Bye. All right. I, have tons. I have tons and tons and tons of questions. Okay. Um, but they don't have to be all asked and answered today. Terry, that was incredible. Um, wow. I, you, guys, you, got, you guys have a lot of experience. And, um, yeah, that's really, <clears throat> that's really helpful. Uh, I'll be honest. Um, and so it, <clears throat> just a couple of practical things. Um, so every time we, we, we were scheduled, you know, I think we have our engagements <clears throat> on a schedule. You will know about it. So when do we just show up or do we need to then email you and say, hey, I'm coming at three o'clock, just a reminder, it's on my schedule. You should know that. So when I show up there, you know, folk are expecting me. Um, I guess I'll just know that once I do this a couple of times, but I was just, I just, because yeah. I've only been there once. I, I, I'm a yeah. little new to that. So um, I keep a calendar of, uh, I keep a calendar at Echo of when all the volunteers are scheduled for um, if they are doing any recurring activities, like even recurring Bible studies, recurring mentoring, right, right, whatever right. it is. So if they're on my schedule, then I give my schedule to Tammy Pownell, who is okay. the person there who keeps the overall calendar. And then yeah. she sends the names to security and then you're okay. voila on the security. Okay. Fantastic. Um, are there hours of day that, you know, is there flexibility in hours of day? For example, it might be more practical to be able to do these after dinner, for example, um, than the afternoons, although that is 
always better than the mornings in my case. And yet, uh, since I'm in the business of cybersecurity, I can't predict when bad guys do bad things or, you know, bad guys and girls do bad things. Um, so when, when the mango hits the fan, it's all hands to the pump, depending on how urgent it could be. Um, and so that could be, you know, that could create disruption. But I want to try and be as predictable as possible because I know how important it is for our youth. Yeah. So um, the it's why it's largely flexible, um, trying to create a sweet spot between what the youth is committed to and what you have going on in your life. Um, some meet in the evening, some do it after school. Wednesdays, okay. I think there's half days. So a lot of people like doing it on the half day because they can go in a little earlier. Um, had one mentor who met with their kid at eight o'clock every Saturday morning, which is not a thing that I could do. Just <laughs> honest. <laughs> So it was um, Jojo who said she wasn't a morning person. Come on. I like being up and about in the morning. I don't like <clears> being <throat> with other people in the morning. <laughs> yeah, that's a different thing altogether. Yeah. 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 So, okay. All right. So it's so, really it will find something that will work. Okay. No, that's 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 really great. Um, yeah, that's good to know. Um, and then if yeah, you did have that emergency that came up, like the bad guys are at your virtual gates. Um, then I think communication, a phone call to the staff in the cottage and making sure they tell the kid that you are not bailing on them, that you are uh, actually, you know, fighting off the, I don't know, the invading hordes. I'm fighting door. a fire. <laughs> Terry, is there, is, so I, I'm assuming there is no scenario where we could do a virtual session um, in the current dispensation. You uh, can, it is much more difficult. Uh, it is actually very difficult because of a couple reasons. The staff do not all equally have access to the iPads that they um, use for Zoom mm -hmm. sessions. Mm -hmm. And then they also don't pay as much attention to the calendar as like Tammy and uh, other people do. So the time will slip by and they'll be like, oh, well. So they don't mm. have a big commitment to it, um, which is really unfortunate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can we talk a little bit more about that? I mean, I think, you know, to the question of how much support, you know, what's reasonable to expect from them? Um, you know, what, what, what would be expecting too much? I think you've just touched on one topic. Um, I want to be, I want to be realistic as well as sensitive to their, um, you know, it's like, Hey, that's not in my job description or no, I'm, I, you know, I'm not going to go do that. Well, if we can, uh, <clears throat> if, if that's something that you want to consider in your um, general uh, kind of things that you want to do, then it, maybe a hybrid model of Zoom and in person. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. No, um, it would just I, depend because not, not all the cottages really have access to an iPad, but some of okay. them do. And so it would be finding, like, there's a couple kids in one of the cottages that I think are really technical kind, like, they would be fine with it, whereas other kids would not be into okay. it. Okay. That's good to know. And, 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 and it would always be a scenario, I think, where you've built the relationship, you've been and they've shown up in person and it would be a, you know, it would be that much less of an issue um, because those connections are all there. Those emotional connections are yeah. all there, clearly. Um, so that is just something to be aware of. And one of the other things that I was considering where I could maybe help out is is a little bit of uh, you know computer literacy and training and and you know and, and you know work in that area. Um, this 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 area, <clears throat> you know, <clears throat> this area strikes me as, I, I you know it's 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 hard to, it, it's tempting to put a value of one thing over another. Um, but this is such an important area um, and vital to to their you know, 
being able to get out and cope practically at an emotional level, even if job skills are not what they need to be, although they're often related, that, um, mm-hmm. you know, I'd love to be able to do this and, 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 and help out um, if practical and if you guys feel that I would be able to add value. But, um, you know, there, there, there are other areas that could work. Mm. Um, that you know and that might be one of them for example um, yeah. I have some questions about your collective you know faith basis for it um, I, you know it was great to just clarify you know request permission and so forth um, where do you guys land on um, you know how how do you, do you how do you set the tone for that is that a you know there's no debate where you stand, maybe you've got chaplain in your title, so there's no debate about where they think you're at. Mm-hmm. Um, and 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 I'm not a great evangelist, I, I you know I I admit, and 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 I don't expect to be in this context. I think I'll be honest. My I guess where I land on this is that it's really unconditional love, and and you know we just show up. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with the Stevens Ministry. Yes. Movement. Um, so I'm a qualified Stevens minister. I haven't practiced for a couple of years because uh, I had to, I became a consultant that traveled a lot and it just wasn't that practical. But, you know, their whole ethos is show up consistently and, and prayerfully, you know, mm-hmm. engage and, and, and God will do the rest. And certainly that is what we experienced um, doing that work. And I guess, you know, I'm, I'm very much at risk of just translocating some of those expectations on how to engage. And it wasn't a professional psychologist. You were just, you know, in this day and age, it's tragic that people just can't even rely on others to show up. And I, I guess that is such a, a baseline expectation. Yeah, yeah. I think that um, that is how I would describe what we do a lot is just show up, try to leave your expectations at home journey with someone um sometimes uh like coping strategies will come up and that's where faith conversations sometimes come up um in that but in the the role of mentoring it would not be an expectation that you're in there like i mean we're mentors i'm the religious coordinator i am a religious coordinator for everyone across the board the and so I'm passionate about everybody having their religious rights protected. <laughs> mm-hmm. So I, I, I want you to be the best Muslim you can be, the best Christian you can be, the best non-practicing person that you can be, like whatever it is. I just want you to be that best person of yourself, best version of yourself. Mm-hmm. Mentoring program just um, fits in because I that relationship development and breaking down those um, behavioral associations that's really important too okay all right um so i complete the application form i get that over to you terry um is there a subsequent interview that is needed um obviously there's some testing that's needed as well and i understand why can, can you just confirm next steps in or is it just uh, in that email that you sent me i'm just going to follow that process right yeah the word document has all the check marks in i think okay. um you're good on like this almost qualifies as the interview so <laughs> okay yeah um <clears throat> and i feel comfortable with you moving forward so then just the other steps that are there okay yeah okay there's a Fantastic. deeper training on trauma there's a deeper right. training on trauma that's recorded that uh, would be the one of the yeah I, th- I was going to also say if your slides are available they were fantastic um and uh, there's a ton of stuff on that google drive i'm i'm i'm, I'm ex-microsoft so i'll forgive you for having worked with google so much and that's okay um but <laughs> my husband works at microsoft so. <clears throat> okay <laughs> is there uh, are there scenarios where we might do co-mentoring just because you want to do coaching as well yeah um, yes. Coaching of me, for example, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, it's... It, sorry. I have a <laughs> circular model. My brain is goes like this, like a bunny rabbit all the time. Like sometimes I just have to stop talking and pull it all back in and speak straightly. 
So yes, we would do some shadow sessions before you get uh, going on your own. And I usually tell the kids that they get the chance to train you. Well, sometimes they do, don't they? Yeah. 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 Fascinating. Jojo, thoughts and comments. I mean, in view of some of the questions I've asked, I'm curious to get your perspective too. Yeah, absolutely. I would say that if you didn't have any questions, it would be more concerning at the end of this. <laughs> so I'm happy to hear that you have a lot of questions. Um, and that's great. That's just on track with uh, kind of where you're at in the process. Um, and yeah, so I think also similar to what Terry said, like, I think that this would qualify as an interview on, on my end as well. Um, and I appreciate, appreciated the questions you asked, especially like around cultural sensitivity and, um, and all of that, because, you know, it's obviously a work in progress for all of us for the rest of our lives, especially as white folks. Wow. Um, and so yeah, I think and- that, you know, it's, it's, um, that's kind of one of the things that I think Terry also is so good at at supplementing all different kinds of information and, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. kind of giving perspective. And, and, you know, you can really, one of the big things that we've, I've talked about in, in discussions about race and uh, just kind of assuming good intent of the, the people that are coming to the conversation, assuming obviously that you're coming with, you know, not to say that you still can't hurt someone or offend someone, but Mm -hmm. um, just that, you know, you're there, that's not your intention um, and you're there to be a supportive system. And so I think a lot of what Terry's trainings um, are really have that lens throughout all of it. So it's not like you need a specific training. Um, Mm -hmm. So I appreciate that also about kind of the resources that she provides is that that's constantly um, something to think about. So. Yeah, yeah that, that cultural question stems from the fact that I was born into apartheid in South Africa and saw how destructive that can be. And right. despite trying to bridge the divide and, and reach out across the racial lines in South Africa, which was hard and frowned upon and often met with some of the really strangest behaviors at our youth group. We were leading a youth group once and we had a, we had a, we had a camp. It was like, all going to go on a camp. And, and one parent said that she would not allow her daughter to go to the camp if there were black people going with us on this camp. And, mm. and those were just those jarring moments. Um, but you just, so you see the destructive behavior. And I think, you know, um, you know, living here for 20 years um, and, and working in a, you know, and really multicultural cosmopolitan organizations like Microsoft and truly, truly, truly coming to grips with, uh, you know, everybody has value, you know, can offer opinion, must offer an opinion. Um, and we only are, none of us is as smart as all of us and truly, you know, coaching the team to sort of behave in that way um, is, has been somewhat of a catharsis for me because of just, some of the background and the prejudices I know that I think we all have. Um, And I, and I, I guess that really was my cultural question as it just feels like there's a chasm between my life experience and what these, these, these poor folk have have experienced. And, um, you know, I just hope we can, we can be authentic um, and, and humble. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, yeah, just like you said, too, you know, like sticking to speaking from your experience, you know, and that's Mm -hmm. all you can know is that that's your experience. So, Mm -hmm. um, and, and um, I think even, yeah, just being thoughtful about it and asking the questions is an amazing place to start um, Mm -hmm. when you're thinking about potentially working with the kids. And um, yeah, but it's, yeah, it's definitely um, something that you can continue to to work on too and you'll see what what works and maybe what doesn't as you start to work with kids like okay that that was maybe a little bit of a flop today so like no (laughs) for next time like not gonna maybe do that so um yeah so it's all it's all a learning process and um we just appreciate the the questions and thoughtfulness ahead of time Mm -hmm. um and all of that so thank you yeah okay maybe my last question is 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 there anything that you folks have found um, resonates with the youth that, you know, you've seen many mentors come and go and 
some work out better than others and what are the characteristics of those? Um, like the ones that come to mind are the ones that are like, oh, I might not have brought her in as a mentor if I had not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it was, um, and that was becoming over-invested in their youth. Like there is a bit of, pra- of a detachment that you have to practice, right? Um, because the youth's success or choices are their choices. They're not a mm. reflection of you. Um, and she was just over-invested and it, it yeah, I had to um, tell her to take a vacation. Mm-hmm. so yeah and so so don't do that <laughs> so how did how did yeah. that show up terry i'm curious was it just that she was getting emotionally too attached and then that became yeah she was emotionally too attached, but then she know. also started like trying to she started talking about well when he leaves detention he, his home is not a good place i should just uh, become a foster parent and he can come <clears> with me <throat> So if that, oh, if a thought of a kid ever yeah. coming into your home happens, then yeah, <laughs> that's a sure sign. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, indeed, indeed. But um, I think that the good, the mentors that have longevity and that have been around are people that have good, just kind of good people understanding. So they have a good capacity to just be empathetic and um, be present and um, they know how to take care of themselves and practice uh, practice what they preach. So they know when to say they need time off and when they can keep on going. They are creative. They, they won't just follow the script. They will, um, you know, if, if I had one uh, guy who, yeah, he was like an accountant type person so like super like linear in his ways of doing everything so he would like make little powerpoints for all the time, right but he made it work for him and the kids enjoyed him and he was he was actually you know he was he was a nice guy he was good at what he did um he's gone he left because covid um covid shut down our mentoring program in detention and he didn't want to stop mentoring so he went to another mentoring organization so he's still mentoring out there in the world um Hmm. so i think it's bringing the gifts and talents that you have and using that in a good way in relationship with youth in detention so um i mean above and beyond being computer savvy right i i'm sure there's other things i mean to me i see a person who is reflective and uh, has the capacity to like be in relationship I don't know what your other hobbies are like if you have hobbies that might be a way you show up too you never know yeah yeah Yeah, I was I was gonna add um to not underestimate like basic common interests I think a lot of times that like we think it has to start deeper or it's very simple like you like cars I like cars like it can literally start Mm -hmm. there um Mm -hmm. with a kid um and also as a super surface, like I'm sure just hearing your accent, kids are going to, where are you from? You know, they're going to have all kinds yeah. of questions and all yeah. kinds yeah. Of, yeah. of things like that too. So there's lots of funny ways that the kids will engage um, that you might not expect. And then that can, you know, unfold into a different conversation. But, um, but yeah. yeah, so I think that was the biggest thing is like not underestimating like the small moments. I think sometimes mm-hmm. people go into it, like wanting to have this profound conversation yeah, sometimes those you're are, just talking those about are the right. yeah. Yeah. Right, right, yeah. right. Well, one of the ways I, I love <clears> to <throat> show up with the kids because it's always surprising for them is playing cards because my grandparents were card sharks and everybody <laughs> in my family plays cards and I can beat every single one of them so, <laughs> mm, sorry. Yeah, so they never the think warning. the little chaplain lady is going to win thanks for the warning I'll never play cards with you if that's the case <laughs> my husband says wow. the same thing he won't play cards with me <laughs> yeah ah, folks wonderful to connect and uh, yeah. thanks for what you do man wow yeah. Thank you. And, and you guys, you guys, you guys know your stuff. Terry, I'm so impressed. Um, gee, I, I didn't expect, you know, the professional depth that you presented here today. And I'm, I'm sure Jojo is the same. She just wasn't the one presenting today, but I'm, I'm quite blown away. I'll be honest. 
Wow. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, maybe it's I, like, thank you. I might just have to ask you to be patient with me, though. <laughs> oh, we all need to be patient. Right? Yeah. yeah. With each other in this world today, patience yeah, is in short supply. That's for sure. Yeah, no kidding. Hey? All right. All right. Thank you so Fantastic. much. Fantastic. All right, good. We'll we'll send all the material through and then we'll hear from you. Okay, great. Thank Fantastic. you so much. Oh, no worries. Thank Take you. care. Cheers then, folks. Bye. Bye.